thank you everyone for coming to this meeting. Well, today we have a fantastic opportunity to uh, listen to one of the experts uh, about business advisory and using visual analytics and AI in accounting and financial domain. Our presenter, Grant Quick, is a Tableau Lead uh, Solution Engineer. He is based in Sydney and he has a terrific experience helping customers all around the world to tell stories with their data. He has worked extensively with accountants and is very passionate about exploring new data visualization techniques to find more effective ways of communicating insights with different audience and stakeholder groups. Grant is a fantastic person to catch up and network and he has a wealth of experience which he's going to share with us. Thank you, Grant, for uh, taking your time to come to us and present. Thank you. It's all yours. Great. Thank you, Maria. And it's great to be here today. I'm always excited to be uh, speaking with people in the accounting industry. Uh, and so I'll just ask if anyone uh, is joining, if they can please go on mute, uh, just so we can keep the line silent throughout the presentation today. Um, but it's great to be working with accountants. And one of my real passion areas is in visual analytics and AI. So. I'm really bringing a lot of uh, passions together today and excited to present to you. So as for the format that we're going to look at today, we'll be looking firstly at what visual analytics is and why it's important. And then we'll be going through three different scenarios. Um, so the first one will be kind of the first level of maturity. We'll be looking at guided analytics and how you can essentially spoon feed clients with um, visualizations and insights that might give them uh, a better understanding of their business. Scenario two then goes a step further and looks at explorative analytics. So this is where you start to let the end user uh, explore the data themselves and visualize it in a way that makes sense to them. And then finally, we'll be taking that a step further once again uh, by looking at predictive analytics and how you can use AI uh, to produce forecasts and recommendations uh, that might help to surface insights that you uh, may not have seen otherwise. Um, now, as Maria mentioned, uh, we'll be taking questions. I'll actually try and take a few questions in between each uh, section just to break it up a little bit. So if you do have any sessions, please just pop them into the chat window and I'll check with Maria at the time uh, to make sure that uh, we can uh, take those questions. I've got about probably 40 minutes of content uh, today, so there'll be plenty of time for questions. Uh, so please don't be shy in uh, bringing them forward. So let's get stuck in. What is visual analytics? This is a definition I really like from Andy Kirk, who's uh, one of the more prominent authors on uh, data visualization at the moment. Uh, he says that visual analytics is the representation and presentation of data that exploits our visual perception abilities in order to amplify cognition. Uh, so the emphasis there was added by me. Um, but I think there's a really important aspect of this definition. Um, it starts off talking about representation and presentation. So these are things that belong to the visualization themselves. But then if you look at the latter half, it talks about um, the actual user that is consuming the visualization. So it talks about how we can exploit their visual perception and how we can help them to understand data better so that they can ultimately inform better decisions. Now, let's have a look at an example of how that works. I'm going to ask you a question. Um, so please pop the answer into the chat window as soon as you think you've figured it out. Um, and I'm only going to give you about five seconds for this question. So make sure you're ready and on the ball and ready to answer. Um, the question is, how many threes do you see in this block of data? All right, got a couple of answers coming in. Oh, <laughs> there's uh, quite a bit of variance there. Uh, so. Just take a pause. I'm going to ask the same question again, but this time I'm going to make it a little bit easier. Now tell me how many threes you think there are in the visualization. All right, now I'm getting a lot of consistency. So it's the exact same block of information, but the second one is by far and away easier to understand and draw insights from. And why is that? Well, we used color to help highlight 
um, what the user is supposed to be looking for. And so this is a technique we can use uh, to start to exploit the way that humans uh, process information um, to make sure that they see what it is that we're trying to communicate to them. Now, it's not just uh, color saturation you could use. You could use uh, the color uh, saturate, sorry, color hue. It could be color saturation. And there's lots of other different techniques that we'll look at today. Um, so the thing is that the brain processes information in certain ways. Um, and if we can understand those better, then we can ultimately communicate more effectively with any data visualization that we have. Now, here's another example, and we'll use this data set a little bit throughout the session today. This one, we're looking at uh, the profitability of different line items that we have in a store. Uh, we've got the different regions that we operate in across the top. And I'm sure to all of you with accounting backgrounds, this looks pretty familiar. Um, I've never met an accountant that uh, couldn't work their way through a spreadsheet uh, pretty easily. Um, but of course, if I asked you which ones were profitable and which ones weren't, you could definitely go through and look at which ones are negative, which ones are positive, and give me the answer. But if we started to make this data set a lot bigger, it would become more and more difficult and easy to just overlook one or two here or there. So if we use a similar technique to what we just had, we can use brackets, we can use color, and this is a notation that, of course, accountants have been using for probably hundreds of years. Um, I know even before computers, um, all the accountants I knew would have colorful pens that they used. Um, and so this is nothing new in the world of accounting. Um, but of course, there's certainly lots of other techniques you can use. If I was to ask you which row had the highest profitability and which one had the biggest losses, um, you could probably figure it out pretty easily, but you'd probably have to double check and make sure you hadn't overlooked anything. Whereas if I looked at maybe representing it in a way like this, oops, then you can see suddenly that uh, it's very quick and easy to identify which one's the biggest black one, which one's the biggest red one. Um, we know which ones are most and least profitable. Now, with this visualization, you don't have the same level of granularity. You can see roughly um, what the profitability was in these areas, but you can't really see um, the exact amount. So there's no one size fits all visualization for every use. Um, there's always going to be things that work well in one scenario versus others. So it's really important to always keep that in mind when you're building a visualization. Now, just exploring what this is um, in terms of humans being able to process information, um, we call it pre-attentive processing. And what that basically is, is it's the human mind's way of simplifying data so that it can draw insights from a huge pool of information. So there was a lot of research that was done around this starting around the 1940s. Um, and it was found that there's about 11 million bits of information um, that get sent to your brain every second. Um, by all the sensors in your body. So about 10 million bits of those information come from your eyes. About 1 million um, typically come from your sense of touch. Only about 1,000 come from your sense of smell. Um, so there's lots of different data points that are coming into your brain, uh, but obviously processing 11 million bits of information per second is just impossible. So we can't possibly take it all in. And if you have a look at this scene, uh, this is Bondi Beach before the lockdown. Uh, obviously there's a ton going on there. And so you've probably already drawn some insights from there. You've probably realized it's a busy day. It's a beach. It's a really nice clear day and the water looks great. There's a bit of greenery around the edge, uh, but your brain probably kind of cut it off there. And the reason for that is that your brain can only process about 50 bits of information per second. So not 50 million, just 50. And so to be able to do that, it has to use patterns uh, to identify things that it thinks might be more important than others. Now, I'm going to give you another example of that. So I'm going to play a video and it's a very short whodunit. What I'd like you to do is to pay attention to detail and see if you can figure out who the culprit is before our trusty detective. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts 
at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Perhaps I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> But how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Why, madam? It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Uh, okay. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Well, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest. Lady Smythe. I really love that video. Oh. I, I love it, but I'm not going to play it again. I don't love it that much. Um, and, and what it shows us is that there's a lot that we miss out on what's going on. Um, I don't know about you, but the first time I watched that video. I don't know about you, but the first time I watched that video. Sorry, it looks like someone's, like someone's unmuted. unmuted. Um, if you could just uh, mute, mute your line and we'll get rid of that echo. Thank you. Um, so as you can see, when um, you have uh, lots going on, it's very easy to overlook certain things that are happening because your brain just thinks maybe these details aren't as important and they're very focused on getting the information um, that your brain thinks it needs. Now, when we talk about patterns um, that our brain can identify, um, we refer to these as pre-attentive visual attributes if we want to sound fancy. So uh, these are things like length, width, orientation, uh, such as angle, uh, it could be shape, size, position, or it could be color like we discussed before. Um, so these are all things that our brain can identify and pick out as being important um, when there is a mass of data that's uh, surrounding it. Now, when it comes to actually uh, doing visualizations, there's three different kinds of information uh, that it's worth considering. And depending on the kind of information uh, determines what the best kind of um, visual attributes are that we can use um, in those cases. So um, if we have a look, there's categorical, ordinal and quantitative. Uh, so categorical is what we call dimensions. Those are the buckets that we can put data in. Um, so things like states, colors, um, people's names that might be the owner of an item or something like that. Um, and then you've got ordinal, which is basically the same, except it has a natural order. Uh, so think about Olympic medals, gold, silver, bronze, uh, it might be sizes like small, medium, large. And then finally, uh, we have what are called quantitative um, measures. Uh, and so these are things that you can measure um, on a continuous scale typically. So they're things like uh, weight or height, uh, might be cost or profit or revenue, uh, and things like discount as well. Um, so there's a scale that goes usually from zero to some other number, or it might include negative numbers, but um, you can basically put a point on the line for what that is after you measure it. Now, depending on what that thing is that you choose, um, that determines uh, the best way to represent that information. Um, so position is always a really effective way of being able to represent information effectively. Um, but you can also use shape, for example, but um, the way you use shape is really uh, determined by what it is. So shape works really well for categorical information. It doesn't really show order though. So it's not great for ordinal information and it really doesn't work at all for quantitative information. Um, if you look at colors, um, colors can work quite well in some scenarios, but not others. And that's partly influenced by the kind of data that you have. So we'll have a look at examples today that cover these things. Uh, but this is worth keeping in mind. Um, I'm always looking back at this, um, this particular uh, screenshot here. This is uh, based hierarchically. So the items at the top are most effective. The ones at the bottom, they work, but they're not quite as effective as the ones above. 
Okay, so before we get into the next section, which is our first scenario, um, are there any questions, Maria, um, that have gone in that uh, I can answer right now? Oh, you're on mute, Maria. Uh, probably no, just you can go, go on. Okay, fantastic. Um, be sure to just uh, throw them in the chat window if you have anything, mm -hmm. uh, but I'll keep going for now. Uh, so scenario one, I mentioned before, is going to look at guided analytics. And for this scenario, we're going to meet Bob. So Bob is a senior accountant at a public practice firm. His small business clients are asking for more help with making business decisions and have expressed an interest in paying for advisory services. Uh, so that's a great position to be in. So Bob decides he's going to start by doing a monthly debrief with each of his clients. And he has to think about how that's going to look. And the thing that comes first to Bob's mind is uh, he'll start with the financial statements. Uh, so balance sheets, P&Ls, and all the usual suspects. And he'll talk through those things with his client and they'll get a great understanding of how their business is doing. Unfortunately for Bob, none of his clients are trained accountants or bookkeepers. So uh, when they start looking at these numbers, their minds start to feel a bit fuzzy and they start to zone out and they don't really know what is doing well and what's doing bad in their business. So Bob goes and he does a webinar similar to this one, learns a little bit about visualization and he starts playing around with some techniques to start showing this information in a different way. So to start with, he looks at the profit and loss and he comes up with the idea of using what's called a waterfall chart. Um, so you can see in here, this uses length, it uses position to an extent, uh, it also uses color. And so our revenue is shown on the left-hand side there. Um, and you can see that uh, it's up about 50K for this month. And then from that revenue, uh, we see all of the expenses get deducted away with the orange bars, leaving the net profit at the end. And so it's very easy from this visualization to see which particular expenses are uh, having the most impact on this business's bottom line. And it also gives us a clear indication of how our net profit compares uh, to our gross profit. Now, if we take this to a client um, and they're looking to reduce cost, we can uh, very clearly make the point that you know, cost of goods sold is uh, very significant. If there's any way that we can try to reduce that, uh, that can help to increase our profitability. Whereas if uh, they want to um, penny pinch and look at, uh, for example, trying to get a cheaper bookkeeper, uh, well, fortunately, Bob's in luck there. They're not going to save very much money uh, because it's a very insignificant amount in the overall picture. Bob then looks at the balance sheet and he represents this in what we call a tree map. Uh, so a tree map is actually a, a visualization type that was invented uh, quite recently. It was only in about the last uh, 10 or 20 years. Um, but it basically represents the um, magnitude of items uh, using the size of the boxes. Uh, so we've got this one color coded. So the assets are in blue. We've got fixed assets in dark blue, current assets in light blue. And as you can see, the buildings and improvements box is by far the biggest. Um, so this is where the bulk of the assets in this business lie. Now we've got the uh, lighter orange color as the owner's equity and the darker orange color is the liabilities. Um, now what's of course very interesting about this is that liabilities is so low. Uh, and so this is a great way of illustrating that to the business. Um, you know, that's not really a problem. It's a great thing to have if you've got no liabilities, but if the business's goal is to grow over the next 12 months, um, then it's very easy for Bob to make the case that this business could be leveraging um, debt or uh, other financial mechanisms to help fuel that growth uh, over the next 12 months. Now, this is a great start for Bob. It means that his customers now have a better understanding of the data and what it means. Um, but when he starts asking them what they think of this session, uh, they tell him, well, look, I came in with some questions in the back of my mind and I don't know that these questions have really been answered. Um, and so Business Advisory 101 kicks in and Bob realizes he never actually sat down and asked the client the questions that they really wanted to ask at the beginning. And so he makes that a point of his engagements going forward 
and he gives the client a call the day before and checks in to see if there's anything in particular they'd like to know about in their session. And sure enough, um, there's questions around uh, which suppliers are the least profitable and things of that nature. So in that example, Bob builds what's called a scatter plot. Um, in this, he has the sales up the side, up the y-axis, and then across the bottom, he's got the profit. And as you can see, there's a pretty linear relationship. The items that are selling uh, in greater quantities and bringing in more revenue are also the items that are producing more profit. Now, he's also added in a discount as a color uh, to each of the bubbles that appears in this scatter plot. And interestingly, uh, all the items down the bottom left tend to be the ones that have the largest discounts. So what this tells us is that these uh, suppliers' items are being heavily discounted uh, so that we can try and move more of them. And as a result, we're not making much profit out of them. Uh, and we're also not really selling many of them despite these uh, profits. And what we might find is that the sales that we make through the suppliers might actually be cannibalizing uh, sales that we have uh, from some of the other suppliers that are bringing in great profits. So it might make sense for this business to review these suppliers and think about whether they wanna have them as part of their portfolio. Now, someone else has a question about um, how they can grow and improve their uh, revenue through sales. And so Bob does what's often called in the sales world a white space analysis. Uh, this is basically a heat map uh, where it looks at how much each client has been spending in different areas. So if we take the top row, uh, you can see Aaron Bergman here. Uh, he buys quite a lot of products from this business, but he's not currently buying any appliances or any paper. And what's particularly interesting is that he is buying copiers and he's buying labels. So why he's not buying paper raises a few questions. So maybe he just doesn't know that this business offers it. Um, there's a conversation definitely to be had there. If we go a little bit further down, you'll see Alan Barnes. He's about the fifth one down. And what's interesting about Alan is that he doesn't buy a lot of products. So he buys a lot of phones, that's quite dark. Uh, but the other items there, there's quite a lot of white space. So there's definitely some opportunity here. And if we have a look up and down the phones column, we can see that the customers who bought phones, like Aaron Bergman, uh, we've got Ann Chong, I think, down below, and then Barry France as well. All of these people all seem to also spend a lot in storage devices. So that might be the best place to start with Alan. If we can uh, talk to him about the great offers that we have in storage devices and the value they can bring his business, that might be a really strong sales opportunity. So there's lots of other techniques we can use. I'm sure you've seen many. I'll talk about some resources at the end um, where you can go and find more examples, uh, but I'll wrap that up for this section. So before I jump into scenario two, are there um, any more questions anyone would like to ask? Not seeing any. No, no worries. Well, now let's meet Deborah. So Deborah is a CFO at an international retailer that operates across Asia Pacific. Her team automatically schedules visual PDF reports to be sent to a variety of stakeholders in her business. People across the business often ask for clarity, however, um, and more explanation around the numbers, and her team struggles to keep up with requests. Uh, now, this is a scenario that I've seen a lot of, and it's not always um, the CFO's team uh, that's necessarily producing these reports. Uh, quite oftentimes it's uh, someone in IT um, because it's a, oftentimes a very technical tool that they're using for building those reports. Um, and the problem is that a huge backlog ends up getting built up. Uh, and anytime you need changes uh, to any of the analytics that you're getting, or you want to explore something a little bit differently, it goes back to the end of the queue and it can take weeks or even months to get an answer to some very basic questions. So Deborah thinks about this and she reflects on a saying that she's heard a number of times. And I've seen this one attributed to all kinds of people, uh, but I believe it comes from uh, Xun Kuang, who was a Confucian philosopher. And it basically says, tell me, I forget, show me, I remember, 
involve me, I understand. And now, if we break this up and think about what we saw with Bob, the first part, tell me I forget, really related to the way that he was doing his business analysis at the beginning, before he got into any kind of visualization. He was just telling people, they didn't really understand it, it was quickly forgotten. Then he moved on to using visualization and people could see it. And so when he started to show some of these big insights, um, they remembered. So they might remember things like uh, those suppliers that weren't performing and think, oh yeah, maybe there's something that I should have been doing with those suppliers. And it's starting to make a little bit more sense. And that is where Deborah is today as well. But to really get people to the next level where they understand data, that's where they need to be involved. And that's where we really talk about the power of visual analytics and the ability to have uh, self-service analytics in any organization or with clients. So I'm going to jump into a quick demo and show you just what that looks like. So of course, uh, as I'm from Tableau, that's the tool I'm going to be using today. And one of the great things about Tableau is that it is um, very easy to use. Um, our philosophy at Tableau is that we want to help people to see and understand data. And the key to that is to make the tool easy enough that they can actually do that. So what Deborah has done is she has built um, some data sets and exposed those to the end users that are consuming this information. Um, and so they can come into uh, Tableau or any kind of product that they're using for this and they can start to explore. Now, they might wanna know about location. Um, so for example, we might say that they've got a strategist in their team, uh, let's call him Richard. And maybe Richard uh, wants to know more about um, which stores are underperforming and which ones maybe should be sunsetted. So he starts by looking at the country region. He just double clicks on there. And that shows us all of the countries that uh, this particular uh, store operates in. And then he wants to look at the profit. So he drags that over onto color. And now we can see uh, basically a heat map of um, the areas uh, that this store operates in and which ones are profitable, which ones are not. Uh, so China, Australia, India, the real strong performers. Uh, then we've got uh, Pakistan, uh, Thailand, uh, the Philippines and South Korea um, holding up a little bit at the end. So maybe there's some stores in these locations uh, that really should be retired. Uh, so let's expand a little bit on that. And we can see things at state level, or we can go down and see the individual stores. And here is where we see uh, some really bright spots. So even in places like Australia, where we're performing really strong, uh, there's some stores that aren't quite pulling their weight. Uh, but because Thailand was one of those countries that we identified at the start, um, let's have a look at Bangkok because it's really not doing well at all. Maybe let's start by having a look at how Bangkok has performed over the time. Um, is this something that's a recent development um, or has Bangkok always been a consistent poor performer? So uh, let's drag on our city filter to start with. And then we'll look at order date. That'll give us uh, time. And I'll look at profit. Now by default, this just has just shown me a table in this case, uh, but I can decide what kind of visualization I'd like to see. So uh, in this case, a line chart usually works really well with time. And that does tell me a great story. What I can see here is that um, actually in 2020, this store was profitable. It's just been in our uh, 2021 financial year that uh, things have really taken a huge plunge. Um, so maybe that was because of COVID. There could be all kinds of reasons. Um, before 2020, uh, there was uh, slight losses in these stores, but nothing too grand. Um, it really is an outlier. So rather than just getting rid of the store, maybe we should do some deeper analysis and understand why it is that it hasn't been performing so well. So let's create another chart around Bangkok. I'll put the city filter in again. And this time I want to look at maybe the profitability of each 
type of uh, item that we're selling in the store. So I can uh, double click to bring my category in and my profit. And this time I might look at that as a bar chart. I'll just add some color in to make that a bit easier to see. And now what we can see is that um, of the three areas uh, that we have, the three categories of items, we have furniture really performing really poorly, which is really dragging this store down. Office supplies also not doing such a great job, but actually technology is profitable. So rather than retire this store, maybe we could start thinking about downsizing and just specializing in certain areas where we do have profitability. But before we go there, let's explore a little bit more. Let's have a look at subcategories. And if we have a look here, well, we do have a couple of items in office supplies that are profitable. It's mostly our storage actually that's not doing so well. But then when we look in furniture, we can see that tables in particular is a terrible performer. Bookcases isn't, isn't doing much better, uh, but there's actually nothing there that's bringing in a profit uh, for this particular store. So maybe the solution is that we just get rid of a few of these categories that we support. Um, we could dig in and have a look at specific line items if we wanted to. And you can see here, every single table that gets sold is not profitable. And so maybe we'll just decide, hey, we're not gonna support tables or bookcases in Thailand anymore. But while we're looking there, why don't we look elsewhere? Let's look at other uh, stores and how they perform. So rather than just focus on Bangkok, Let's filter it down and let's have a look at every store that we have. And as you can see, Tables actually is a poor performer across the board. So now Richard is probably going to be more focused on which categories of items we support, in particular Tables. And he's not thinking really at all about Bangkok anymore. And the solution he originally had, which was to um, cut costs by retiring the stores that don't perform, is now far from his mind. Now he's more focused on which line items. Um, so he doesn't have to worry about the guilt he's going to feel for all the staff whose jobs would have been lost in Bangkok. Um, instead, the company can focus on the line items that are going to be profitable uh, and it's going to be a win-win. And so as you can see, as Richard, I started with a thought in my mind. I thought, how can I uh, reduce cost and uh, make our stores more profitable? well, I'm going to retire one of our stores. But then when he started to dig into the data and ask more questions, he got insights that he didn't even think of when he began. And so that's the beauty of explorative analytics. Whereas you might start with one question, you might ask why when you get to the result that you receive. And if you keep asking why, you'll keep getting to more and more questions and getting a deeper and deeper understanding of that information. And so at the end of the day, he's got a great understanding of what can be done to help improve the situation that this store has in profitability um, without having to make the sacrifices that he thought he would. All right, so coming back to the slides, uh, that's what I wanted to cover in that particular section. Um, are there any questions that have come in? Uh, Maria, it looks like maybe there is one. I've got a question from Amanda. Uh, the chatting aspect seems quite user-friendly. Typically, the sole traders are uh, the small family-owned businesses struggle with data entry that is required to build visualizations. Does the software interface with the different, uh, comes with the different accounting packages or Excels? Yep, absolutely. So um, with Table in particular, we do integrate with uh, many different sources. I'll just uh, jump back quickly to show you some of what they are. So if I go to add a new data source, um, it will prompt me with all the different kinds of connectors um, that we have. Um, so it has Excel, I think, because oh, Excel's under files, uh, but you can do Excel files, CSV files, um, but you can also connect directly to a lot of products. Um, so I know in the accounting space, we do connect with uh, QuickBooks online. Um, we also have partners who've built connectors for Xero and Myob. So, um, it's very easy to pull a lot of information in from different areas um, and being able to augment that information together is often where the real value is uh, because a lot of people have been doing this kind of reporting in one of their tools 
But if they don't have information coming across from other tools that they use, it's often very siloed and doesn't give them a great overall picture. Um, so by using this, you can certainly bring that all together into one place. Great. Well, if there's no other questions for now, uh, which partner supports Zero Myob? Um, happy to talk about that offline. Um, so I'll make a note of that and we can be in touch. So let's get back into the presentation. And we've come to our third scenario. Uh, so this is predictive analytics with AI. So this time we're going to meet Laura and Laura is part of an advisory team at a mid-sized accounting firm. She helps customers to build a data culture that enables data-driven decision-making. Laura has been looking for a new way to differentiate her services and is keen to explore AI. However, she has an accounting background and finds the idea daunting. And I can't blame her for that because my background is as a software engineer and up until just a few years ago, I found AI very daunting as well. Uh, but the great news is that a lot of new tools have come out uh, that have really simplified the use of AI. And now it's something that people that are in business advisory can easily leverage um, without having to have a data science team at their disposal. Um, certainly having a data science team is helpful. They can build much more sophisticated models and uh, get even deeper insights. Uh, but being able to do self-service in this area is a huge, huge step up uh, for a lot of people that simply didn't have that capability before. So I'm going to jump across uh, to one of the features that we support, which is called um, Einstein Analytics, um, or I should say uh, Einstein Discovery, and uh, show you exactly how this can be done. So I'm going to start by looking at a um, CSV file that I've got. This particular CSV um, shows for a particular um, organization all their different stores, and it shows how many items in particular categories uh, they sell on a daily basis in those stores for a particular month based on the promotion um, that that item has, whether that's a mail-in promotion or a contest or um, anything like that. And it also shows the discount that we offer in those areas. So what I can do is I can upload that into Einstein Discovery. And I've already done that in this case. So what I can then do is create a story. And I'll create that from the data set that was created when I uploaded the data. Here's my data set. And then what I need to do is select uh, basically the column or the variable that I want to optimize. So in this case, what I'd love to be able to do is to increase my sales. So what I want to optimize is the daily quantity. Now I can do just insights, which is faster, or I can do insights and predictions, uh, which takes a little bit longer. And that's what I'm going to do in this case. And then if I want to, I can decide which things I want to include, which things I want to exclude. And um, that way I can make sure that uh, the analysis is focused on the things that matter. Um, so for example, in a lot of data sets, you might have a variable um, that just shows the uh, ID number of a certain item. And that of course, isn't actually going to have a bearing. We know that in reality, uh, but sometimes you have what's called spurious correlations where uh, it looks like there is a relationship. And so you wanna make sure that any variables like that get excluded. Um, or sometimes you might have duplicate variables. Um, and that's a really common way of introducing data bias. So um, if for example, um, you might have uh, two different revenue figures, one might be um, the amount of revenue that that item brings in. Um, and then the other one might be the amount of revenue after discount. And so those are basically the same thing, they're very closely correlated um, from an AI algorithms perspective and it can bias a data set. Uh, so we've got to be really careful about that. Um, now, my apologies, I did mean to um, prepare one earlier and I forgot. So um, this usually takes about two minutes to run through. Um, what it's basically doing is it's going through detecting patterns. Um, it's going to have a look, not just at each individual aspect, 
um, it will actually look at uh, pairs of characteristics as well. Um, so that's where a lot of the really powerful insights come in because they're not often obvious to people. Now, it has just finished. Um, so what it's done is it's gone through all our data. There are about 30,000 different rows. And it's found that for all the different categories we have across all the different stores, uh, the average daily quantity is 334. Now, if we have a look down the left here, we can see which particular variables had the strongest correlations. So store had a very uh, strong correlation there, followed by month, followed by promotion. And then item and discount, correlation was so low, it's really not significant whatsoever. So we can really ignore these two. Now, what we see here are uh, some insights around those pairs of combinations and those individual variables that affected the outcome. Uh, so we can see that month is November has a particularly strong impact. But when we combine that with different kinds of promotions, so month is November, promotion is display, or month is November, promotion is coupon, that has an even greater effect. So these are two ways that we can ensure that these things get optimized. Now, store in Sydney also has a great impact. Store is Melbourne. When the store is Melbourne and the discount is a certain rate, apparently that has a good effect as well. And then over to the right, we can see where things are having a negative impact. So Ballarat is not a strong performer, especially when the promotion is mail-in. Perth has similar issues as does Wagga and Dubbo. Now we can scroll down and get better detail into any of those insights. Uh, so store was the first one there. And as you can see, uh, Sydney and Melbourne really are the shining stars for this business. They're bringing in uh, the bulk of our revenue. Whereas the others are all generally below average. Uh, in some cases like Perth and Ballarat, uh, performance is not strong at all. Now, when we start to combine the data and we talk about the month and the store, what's interesting is that it has a multiplier effect on our strongest performers. So Sydney, uh, Melbourne's just gone off the screen a little bit there, um, but uh, you can see Sydney here is uh, doing a really strong job uh, and it's basically tripled its um, sales in November. Whereas some of the weaker performances, uh, performers have doubled their sales, but they haven't tripled them like Sydney and Melbourne have. So what we've looked at so far here is just an analysis of the past. This is just looking at the data this is not that different to what we've done so far with visual analytics. Now, um, of course, the, the great benefit here is that this has gone through everything um, in just a couple of minutes. Um, there weren't that many variables in this case, so it's something we could have done visually and just looked at scatter plots and things like that. Uh, but when you have a data set that has 100 or 200 different columns of data, obviously that becomes overwhelming. So being able to use machine learning in those kind of instances um, can really make your life a lot easier. But then the other part, which I wanted to get to here, of course, was predictions. So we can actually start to understand what we would expect for our daily sales based on various factors. So let's start with our Sydney store. And our daily quantity typically for a Sydney store, regardless of the item we're selling, uh, would be 799. Now, if we wanted to improve that, maybe we could have a look at the month of December and we can see that yes, in December, we typically see a big uptick. We're getting close to the holiday season or we are in the holiday season then. So um, that's not a great surprise at all. But what we might wanna do is see how we can influence shoppers during that month to bring this number up even further. So what we can do is take a step further and have a look at recommendations, which is known as uh, prescriptive insights. And so by clicking over here, uh, we do an analysis of what could be done differently with promotions to give us the biggest impact. And as you can see, display has the biggest impact here, and this will have a huge effect on our sales for this particular month. It'll nearly double our sales, in fact. Coupon would also have a great impact Contest would have an impact, but not so great. May not be worth the investment, uh, but certainly let's go with display in this case. And we can see exactly what impact that's going to have. That's going to be a bumper month. 
Now, we might want to think about doing a different kind of campaign uh, at another time of year. So maybe we want to run a contest. And rather than optimize uh, on promotion, what we want to do now is optimize on month. And it looks like actually December is the best month in this case. But what if I was looking at a different store? Maybe we're looking at Ballarat. Well, we can see that in Ballarat, the best time to run a contest would actually be in March. And that has a significant impact. We're basically multiplying our result there by six or seven. So let's change that to March. And suddenly we've got a store that's been underperforming that now has found a way to have a really bumper month. Now, there's a lot that you can tweak in here. Um, so if we go and have a look at our model, um, you can actually change the algorithm that gets used if you uh, really get into data science and want to understand um, different kinds of uh, models that you can use. Um, it actually shows you how accurate the results are going to be based on the data set. So that basically depends on the variability of the data. Um, the more various uh, variance there is in the data, um, the less likely you are to get a strong prediction. So in this case, we've got a pretty good model. And um, of course, this is quite a simplistic tool in the fact that it is all no code based and it is designed for business users to use. Uh, but if you wanted to give this to a data science team and let them expand on it, uh, you can actually copy this out to R code, uh, which can be used in a lot more hands-on deep and dirty tools. Um, so you can really ramp things up further if needed. There's also the ability to uh, change the um, data that's being used. So for example, you might find that there's uh, outliers um, that should be excluded. Uh, maybe it was uh, some data that was misentered. Maybe there were too many characters or something like that. So any data that stands out as being uh, a bit off skew from everything else that we have uh, might be something we can exclude uh, to ensure that our data is even stronger in this model. Now, in terms of use cases for this, what we've looked at today was really just around sales. But if I come back over to our deck here, there's all kinds of use cases that you can have using this kind of analysis. Anytime that you have a variability. Oh, yep, sorry, go ahead. We've got a question from Bertrand. Uh, just wondering, can uh, you use a global sensitivity analysis to check if you have spurious correlations? Great question. I don't know that you can. Uh, and that comes back to the ability to export out. So there's certainly tools that can do that. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, we can't do that in Einstein Discovery today. And for those of you who don't know, a spurious correlation um, is basically when you have uh, two variables that look like they correlate, uh, but in reality, uh, one is not the cause of the other. Um, so there's actually a really good website if you search for spurious correlations, uh, I'm sure you'll find it. Um, but you'll find things like um, the number of uh, kicks that Chuck Norris does in a year correlates with um, the rate of hamburgers being eaten and things like that. So um, just because two things look to be related, it doesn't mean they actually are. Now, uh, coming back to some of these predictions, um, as you can see here, you read through, it's not just about sales. It might be looking at customer service and making sure that um, people don't have to keep requesting the same things all the time, uh, make sure their cases get escalated quickly. Uh, it could be things like HR and improving the uh, rate of attrition with employees. It could be in operations and uh, reducing costs, or it could be in marketing around improving ROI uh, to ensure that your campaigns are running effectively, uh, which was something that we actually did touch on in that example. So that brings me to the end of that scenario. Um, I'll do a quick wrap up soon. Um, so maybe I'll just do that and then we can take any other questions that come through. So just in terms of going away today, uh, I would love to think that um, you've all been a bit inspired to look at new visualization techniques. And a really great place to look is public.tableau.com. Uh, we call it Tableau Public. And what this is, is it's a site where you can share visualizations that are created with Tableau. So um, if you go on there, there's a search function. You can search for accounting, you could search for finance or anything that might be of interest to you. And um, you'll be able to see lots of great examples of what people have done. 
um, and they tend to get rated uh, or ranked in the search by how many views and how many likes they've had. So you'll see some really strong examples come through there uh, as a great way to uh, spend an hour or two if you have the time. Also, if you are interested in using Tableau, uh, we do offer a 14 day trial uh, that's available through our website. Um, the tool is, um, as you saw today, uh, it's uh, web based, so you can um, just get a login and uh, use it uh, through your browser. And we do also have a desktop tool if you prefer to use that, but um, certainly uh, functionality wise, they're quite similar. Uh, so were there any other questions that anyone would like to ask uh, before we do wrap up today? A quick question from Aaron. How easy to learn Tableau compared uh, to uh, compared with Power BI? Yeah, no, good question. Um, I don't like to sling off competitors and go head to head, but what I will say about Tableau is that it is the easiest to learn, I believe, uh, in the market uh, by quite a long way. Um, with a lot of other tools, you can do the basics very easily, uh, but any time the slightest bit of complication comes in, uh, a lot of the other tools make it really difficult. And so some of those tools have uh, programming languages in their back end. And so once you have to get into them, you've essentially got to have a software engineering degree to make sense of them. Um, whereas with Tableau, um, all of our calculations that are custom are done with simple formulas, uh, very similar to Excel formulas. Um, so the learning um, curve, I guess, for Tableau is much lower and steadier uh, than you'll typically find with most products. I see there's uh, a couple of questions that have come in around uh, pricing. Uh, so with Tableau, um, there is a commercial version and there is a free version. Um, so the free version, um, the big restriction is that you can't save data locally. Um, so it's only really designed for using with Tableau Public. Um, so if you wanna just play with Tableau, um, you can certainly get by with that and it never expires. Um, but if you want to use it with confidential data, like your client's information, um, then certainly it's not appropriate to use that. Um, you can get the 14 day trial of the commercial license um, and go from there. Uh, in terms of uh, partner packages for accounting firms, unfortunately, we don't have any of those. Um, but um, we certainly do have a partner program if you are wanting to get more into consulting and helping your clients to um, start using Tableau. Uh, so if that's of interest to you, have a look for our partner program on the website um, and find about the details there. I've got a big question from Chris. I have learned Tableau and one of the real benefits for me is to be able to create a dashboard with multiple visualizations on, on, on one page. This could be both financial and non-financial data. From a finance perspective, there could be multiple sources of data, such as the accounting systems, budget systems, CRM systems, etc. Do you find clients will link all of these separate systems to Tableau or go via a data warehouse? Yeah, that's a great question. And thanks for calling that out, Chris, because um, it's great to hear you've found some um, use there and uh, got some um, value out of using Tableau. Um, I work a lot with enterprise customers, and so most of them go through a data warehouse, um, and that's a performance issue. Um, what you don't want when you've got really critical systems like ERP systems, um, you don't want to have people that are running Tableau visualizations um, to be pinging that database all the time and creating a lot of network load. So you wanna basically isolate that data away from the production system. And that's what a data warehouse will do. Um, now, if you're working with smaller clients, that might not be the case. So if they're pulling data from QuickBooks Online, for example, um, that's really not such an issue. You would just go direct. There's no need for a data warehouse or anything fancy. Um, and what we we'll often see is that a lot of data still comes in from Excel. Um, so oftentimes there'll be just shared spreadsheets on shared drives that people um, will use to bring data into Tableau, uh, or it might be through another tool like MuleSoft. MuleSoft will often give them an Excel extract and um, you can bring that data in. Um, so we typically see that nearly every organization doesn't just go direct to one data warehouse. They'll still usually have needs that go beyond that. Um, but yeah, data warehouses is definitely more for larger clients that have um, more of those uh, mission critical systems.
I think that's a fantastic tool to start uh, learning your way, uh, how you can explore things with the data. And giving uh, so many opportunities there, that's really uh, worthwhile having a try and having a deep dive into you know, what can be explored further. Especially that's uh, that aspect of introducing AI, also and else looks like really, uh, really uh, down to earth and straightforward for business owners. Thank you, Grant. All right, thanks everyone. Really appreciate your time today. Um, uh, stay in touch. Thank you so much for presenting to us. That was uh, really a great presentation. Uh, we are going to distribute the recording of this session. And if somebody wants to connect, uh, Grant, I think you are available for further discussion to be taken offline and just uh, moving on with that. Thank you for, uh, for your participation. Thank you for your presentation. Absolutely. See you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Bye.